Hello, everybody. I'm Ian Billinghurst, your host for this Raw and Natural Feeding Summit. And this is a kickoff. Well, it's, it was described as a party, but I, as we're at so many different um, time zones, some of us early in the morning haven't even had maybe had our first coffee, and some of us late at night. So it's, it's a kind of a party, but really it's a panel interview. And what we're here to do is encourage you to join this summit on raw and natural feeding. And I'm going to introduce, and sadly, one of our speakers has not been able to attend today, but we have two wonderful veterinarians with us. We have Dr. Nicole Rouse and also Dr. Amaya Espindola. I think I got that one right. So, Dr. Nicole, could you wave and say hello to our audience? And Dr. Hi, Amaya, can you wave and say hello? Thank you Hello. very much. Now, raw and natural feeding, is it important? Should we do it? I think the answer to that is yes. And if you have joined this summit, I suspect you think the same way. Because what we're looking through, looking for, is health in our pets. And the question that is on your mind is, is this the way to go? And, you know, I want to talk about a very, very simple analogy that I use all the time when talking about this. If you buy a new car, what are the spare parts, the servicing, the lubrication? What's the fuel that you use? Surely you use what the maker recommends and has designed for that car. And that's what we're doing here. We're talking about the very foods that the maker of our cats and dogs has designed for, our, for those very species of animals. And of course, the maker, whichever way you look at it, it's most definitely evolution. And whether you believe God provided that evolution or whether it just happened, it doesn't really matter in terms of what we're talking about today. Because evolution over many millions of years has determined what your dog should eat. And it's actually whole, raw and natural food. And the word natural actually means evolutionary derived. And that's what natural is all about. Nothing else just how each species arrived here through a long process of evolution to actually eat specific foods that it was designed to eat. So this is what we're talking about, health through design. And the design of our cats and dogs actually requires raw whole foods. So in this summit, we want to look at this way of feeding and I want to take away the fear because so many people are afraid of raw. They're afraid of balance. They're afraid of bones. They're afraid of bugs, the three things that really worry people. But you can embrace raw once you understand this, because our whole idea is to empower you, the pet parent, to feed your beloved animals, the ones that live with you, your family members, for the best outcome, which is a long life free of disease. Firstly, in the first section, we're going to just introduce you to raw. And I'm going to talk in more detail about the design of our pets. Then we're going to move on to the building blocks of raw, the very bits that you need, bones, raw meaty bones, meat itself, organ meats vegetables they're very important fermented foods all these things we're going to talk about and then we're going to talk about those other worries that you have the obstacles to feeding raw those bugs bones and balance that's very important we'll talk about that and then with the finally we're going to talk about how you might modify raw for example dr amaya will talk about cats who are very specific in their requirements because they're obligate carnivores but she'll talk about that do you have to modify raw for different stages of life and can you modify raw in the face of disease so all of these are questions we're going to cover and that's what you can look forward to in this summit it will be a very empowering and exciting journey for you all and we're looking forward to presenting this information to you now having introduced you to that and i hope i've whetted your appetite for this we're going to hear from each of our wonderful panelists 
Sadly, we, we have one missing, but we're going to fill in with two excellent and wonderful people, Dr. Amaya and Dr. Nicole. So now, they're going to present, they're going to talk to you now, hope they're ready, about their unique perspectives on incorporating raw food into feeding your pets, and maybe a little bit about their very specific topic. And I'm going to start off with Dr. Nicole. Now, Dr. Nicole is an integrative veterinarian, so she combines... I guess, conventional veterinary medicine with uh, natural or whole raw feeding. And, and that's very important. Dr. Nicole is from Melbourne, Australia, owns Mont Albert Veterinary Surgery and runs the natural pet health, pet health and lifestyle brand called Shy Tiger. Now she's, her, her, her goals, her dedication is empowering pet owners through education, education on optimal pet care. So this, this is wonderful it's not just handing out drugs from dr nicole i think she provides a service rather like myself um she's very well this is not this is definitely not me but she's very active on social media and shares great information on tips on fresh feeding and natural health alternatives that's wonderful now, her goal dr nicole's goal is to help pets live their best lives by promoting a holistic approach to pet wellness. Isn't that wonderful? So now, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Nicole. Dr. Nicole, can you now speak to us about your approach to raw and natural feeding and your particular topic, which I believe is supplementing raw food? Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so I'll start off with talking about my presentation first, if you like, because it's That's a fine. fantastic topic I've got coming up for the Pet Summit. So we're going to be talk of, talking about supplementing raw diets, and I think quite a hot topic and a, a topic that a lot of people get a bit worried about and oftentimes over supplement. I think they fall for a lot of marketing and things and they try to get all the things because they're so worried about, you know, not ticking all of the boxes. So what we do with our talk is I go through the fundamentals of whether the modern dog is truly different to their, uh, to their ancestors and how physiology has potentially changed we look at that and then we go through modern farming practices so that we can compare perhaps changes in the food that we're providing our modern dog and whether they might be missing some nutrients. And then that helps lead to understand why we may need to supplement in certain situations based on modern sort of farming practices. And if you think of intensive farming and and how the nutrient profile might have changed. And then we go through the physiological changes in our pets that may demand more supplements. So I guess a, a standard supplement, there's something like we'll talk about kelp powder or alfalfa powder, like I know you're quite familiar with that, Ian, and, and brought that to us um, to tick off some phytonutrients and trace minerals. Uh, we'll talk about really common supplements like our omegas that we need a lot of. We love our omega-3s these days, especially with the farming practices. Um, and then I'll go through lots of the popular ones like turmeric. Um, you know, we go through it all, even the brand new one that lots of people have heard about, the palmitoylethalonamide, you know, the PEA, which is a fantastic one. So it's jam-packed full of lots of really practical tips for people, lots of dose rates of supplements if they're a bit worried how much to give their pet. We've got dogs and cats in there. I think we can't, sure, Dr. I may agree, and they can't forget about the cat. Um, and it's just a really nice practical presentation. I think every single person will take something away and maybe tweak what they're doing, but just have a bit more confidence. So that's my goal with that presentation. But my approach to raw feeding uh, with my sort of pet parents or the community I present to, as as you mentioned, Ian, is all about is uh, all about education because I really started my vet career as a conventional vet. I was a kibble feeding vet. I rolled my eyes internally when I was presented with parents that fed raw. I honestly did. So, and I've been a vet for 15 years. So it's, it's still fresh in my mind, the mind of being a kibble feeder. And so I'm really passionate about educating our pet parents to help them understand the physiology of the dog and help break down those barriers to the obsession about the complete and balanced every single meal. And the fear around fresh feeding. And I, I really honestly find that once they understand why 
dogs and cats benefit from being fed raw, real food, um, what's most natural to them. And they understand the concept that the more we deviate from what nature intended, the more likely we are to have problems. Once the piece drops, it's smooth sailing. They're, they're on board. Um, and so then we just go through the education around it. We're really, I'm in suburban Melbourne. It's really easy for me to have access. Most of my pet parents will go straight to one of the the balance, uh, AFCO standard, you know, raw food. That's how when they start, get their confidence up and they know, you know, if they can't quite let go of the complete amounts in every meal, that's a really nice way to start raw feeding from some fantastic brands in Australia and then they get the confidence up and then they get into the raw meaty bones and then they you know they might give a whole meal as a raw meaty bone instead of the perfectly balanced meal and, and then they see the changes in their dog and they're on board it's um it's really easy for me there and they're really well supported I think education's the absolute key to, to moving to a raw diet wow Nicole you are a, a girl after my own heart that's wonderful <laughs> that's uh, that's exactly where I've been for all my career. Uh, that, that is incredibly good. Fantastic. All right. Now, Dr. Amaya Espindola. I think I got that right. Yes, Dr. Amaya Espindola. It. She is has been described or is described as a very versatile individual. Well, a, a doctor, a veterinary surgeon. Now, she has excelled in various fields, such as, well, veterinary medicine, but music, coaching, entrepreneurship. And over the past decade, she's resided in Mallorca, Mallorca, Spain. I hope I got that right too. I'm very bad at pronunciation. I only did first year French when I was in school and learned things like Le Chien est sur la table. That's the extent of my ability to talk in other languages anyway. And ironically, that, that remembrance, the dog is on the table. My goodness, that's been my whole life professionally. But anyway, I, I, I diverse. So, so Dr. Amaya has... This wide background, not just veterinary medicine, and um, she's developed a deep passion for cats. And we have our own little cat here, and I've always had cats, and they're very, in actually, I think of cats more like women and dogs like men. C kind of dogs are, yeah, right, cats are smart, and they're always doing things that will be high, and you think, oh. And if I want really good advice, you go to a woman because they're smart. Anyway, so so cats, they're very different. And I think Dr. Amaya has seen this captivating world of cats. And so she employs unconventional methods to enhance her expertise in feline behavior, utilizing her knowledge to promote a fresh understanding of cats. And I've seen a little bit of her work, not a lot, but a little bit. And it's, it's very refreshing. And you learn a lot just by a few minutes by being with Dr. Amaya. Her mission is to revive their innate wild instincts and you know when you feed raw you start to do that and also educate pet owners about the profound bond between humans and cats our cat is so smart she tells me what to do all the time so there's two of them in my life that do that the cat or actually three there's a dog that does the same but anyway so dr amaya emphasizes how this connection can enrich our daily life so without further ado dr amaya can you talk about I, both what you're going to present and also about RAW itself and your particular approach to RAW. We're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Actually, when I when I saw it, it was like, wow, nobody described me better. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yes, I do have a, a different approach with cats because I'm a very curious person. And actually how I got into RAW was thanks to your book. And uh, somebody, I don't know, somebody showed me that your book and suddenly it all made sense. I, I've been a kibble feeder like all, all, this, all my years. And then suddenly I got that book and I said, how come this happens, right? So in, in my life, everything came across like that, right? So with cats as well, I was I was fearful of cats. Actually, I had a lot of respect to them. And my overcoming of this fear was the, the, the thing that developed all this passion for them because I said to myself, I can't be a vet if I'm afraid of half of the population that I'm going to be treating. So... <laughs> So I decided to work with specialists and, and start working. And, and then I understood there was something behind it. And uh, I had really good teachers into this. So when, once I got, I um, in my experience, I had to work a lot with behavior. I work in animal protection services. And that allowed me to work with many cats at the same time, behavioral problems. And, uh, and then I noticed that despite we were doing a lot of things 
in health, there was something missing. And that's when your book showed up. And then we started working with our animals, with raw food. And that's when I noticed that all the medications that I was using, because imagine that if you work with a lot of cats at the same time, the stress levels are high. But when we start feeding raw, not to all of them, but to most of them, actually diseases decreased. And, uh, and you know, I was starting, I was able to use more natural sources in medicine. And then I was able to open up to all these new things that I do today. So I thank to that job that I had before, because this is what allowed me to be what I am today. And uh, this is what I'm actually teaching you in, on, on the modifying the diet for, for cats, because it, it's not only about the diet for a cat, it's pretty simple, but the problem is that it's hard for the cat to, ha- to, to eat it. Transition is the biggest issue that most cat parents have, and they don't understand how cats actually relate to food, how important it is, what, what mechanisms, uh, you know, I- internal mechanisms they have to approach to food. And so we, we, we believe, we, we know that they are the true carnivores, but yet they are really addicted to the ultra process. So there is a mechanism of why this happens. And this is what you're going to learn from, from my talk. And this is what I, what I learned when I tried to, to uh, switch uh, a cat that came from a really unknown uh, background and tried to switch him to raw to make him be better with uh, lower, uh, decreasing their stress levels. And and trying to behave. So I noticed that there was a, a really tight correlation between behavior and nutrition in cats. So what happens when you when you have to deal with that at home, then it becomes, you know, people are this we still don't know. We haven't evolved the same way with dogs and cats. So the guardians are a bit, you know, they they, they get stressed so easily. And also there's so much fear around the, if my cat is not eating, if it's been 28, 20, 24 to 48 hours, my cat is fasting, then he's going to die. You know, there are so many things coming around that it makes it more complicated into this process. So my talk is going to be a little bit more, you know, refreshing. Uh, first of all, why it's so important that we feed them raw, because that's really important, but also to understand that there is a lot of, of, of other process that you have, you know, your mind process, that it goes beyond the bones, the buds, and the, and the balance. It also comes through, my cat is not eating. What should I do? Should I offer another cat? Should I do this? Should... So, they, the, you know, the pet parents get so crazy about it that they, they prefer to take a step back. And that's what I want to stop. I want to make sure that they get to know their cat understand that that what the physiology and then say okay this is what i can do it might take me longer than expected but i i know i'm doing the right thing and i hope that comes across in my talk otherwise you can go to the q a's afterwards and ask me <laughs> or more details thank you so much dr mayor i am so looking forward to both these talks i know i'm going to learn a lot from both of you um supplementation in many ways with the my own, I guess my own animals, I've avoided it. Uh, and, and mostly I think for good reason, but I know it can be extremely valuable. And this, these mysterious creatures we call cats, I am so looking forward to, to learning more from somebody who's really looked into this. So to both of you, I look forward very much to both of your lectures. And I'm hoping that hearing this, those pet parents out there will be ex- as excited as I am to hear from both of these wonderful veterinarians. Now, somebody has put together this panel discussion. It wasn't me. It was given to me, and it was a, a wonderful outline. So what I've been asked to do now is give a brief overview of the benefits and principles of raw and natural feeding for pets. Well, you know, the benefits are quite simple. A long life and a healthy life. A lot of veterinary costs gone. And for your animal and yourself, the joy of life living without having been hopping on what I call the medical or veterinary merry-go-round. Because once you hop on that and you're on a, and usually it's an animal that is being fed, or it always is actually, almost always, with processed pet foods, that medical merry-go-round then becomes drugs and then side effects, more drugs to beat the side effects. And it just goes on and on. And it's a downward spiral. And it's very sad. And so many pets today 
are on this medical or veterinary merry-go-round. So the benefits are really simple, a long and healthy life, simply by switching animals to the food that they were designed to use. Now, somebody mentioned principles, and the principles are really the principles of evolutionary nutrition. People an evolutionary food, because I like to leave the word nutrition and nutrients out as much as I possibly can, because what we're doing is feeding food. And when you get the food right, the nutrients follow, unless, of course, as Nicole will talk about, there are some very heavy def- or very bad deficiencies in the soil on which that food was actually grown. But apart from that, it's a matter of feeding the food that our dogs and cats were designed to require by a very long process of evolution. And once we do that, when we supply the foods that our dogs and cats were designed to use in their broad spectrum, very broad, so variety is key here, and it roughly, and I say roughly, and Nicole mentioned this, roughly in the evolutionary balance, and it's different for dogs and cats, by the way, cats being obligate carnivores, their, their balance is different to the dogs because the dog, this, and we'll concentrate just for a moment on the dogs. Our dogs, and they're important words. For, for a cat, the, it's probably the simplest creature on earth to feed. They're, they're obligate carnivores. They just eat other animals. And the whole prey model actually completely suits a cat. And remember, the whole prey also has some gut contents and a little bit of feces too. So you've got to keep all of that in mind. It's a whole prey. For the dog, it's different. Our dogs are scavengers. They're scavengers. Now, that means they eat a lot of food that is going off. They eat a lot of bones because what's left over for a scavenger when another animal, such as an obligate carnival, for example, has eaten food? There's a lot of food left over that that is bone. So this is why I wrote the book, Give Your Dog a Bone, because it's very important to understand there's a difference here. This is not the... The whole prey model does not actually work, particularly for a growing, because a growing pup needs that all those extra bones for its growth of its own bones. But that's something I talk about too in the importance of bones. Now, what what happens when you feed a real food? Well, you feed this nutrition, which is actually balanced biologically as opposed to legally, and that's far better. It's got it's got the nutrients we know about, nutrients we don't know about. And the nutrients we don't yet understand as being important. So that's a wide range of stuff. It's quite different from AFCO or FIDIAF or even NRC. But you're looking at psychological and mental health. You're looking at digestive health, dental health, the proper growth and development of young kittens, where the, where the bone and joint health is so important. You're looking at a food that supports the microbiome. And we're just beginning to understand how the microbiome is so important in every aspect of health, including mental health and support and against aging and degenerative disease. So you're feeding food that supports the immune system. And for those who are worried about this one disease, this is a diet that is very much a cancer preventative because it's not high in the one nutrient that feeds cancer. There's that nutrient called sugar. And all processed pet food today being based on carbohydrates is that. So That's my introduction. This is what you're learning about when you learn about raw and natural feeding. Now, I'm going to now ask our panellists, we need to discuss common challenges and misconceptions associated with uh, natural feeding. And we need to address any safety concerns and potential risks, which people worry about, such as bacterial contamination. So, Nicole, could I ask you to start off by talking about this in a general or well as be as specific as you like but uh, the challenges misconceptions that people have and perhaps looking particularly at bacterial contamination yeah thanks Ian that's great Uh, for me I think the one of the biggest challenges for pet parents who uh, commit to raw feeding or to really incorporate it is all mindset I think it's either their internal mindset um, and that comes across from the history of what they may have been feeding. And and as I sort of mentioned earlier, this obsession with complete and balanced and and letting go of that need to have that complete and balanced meal every single meal of the day. And I'll often, you know, I'll often give them analogy of of a human child and I'll say to them, well, would you, if you took your human child to the doctor and they said to pick one cereal, one protein powder, one synthetic vitamin and feed that to your human child every day for the rest of their life, 
and don't feed fresh meat vegetables, would you look at them and think, oh, amazing. Okay, I'll do that. It just doesn't even make sense. So I, it's breaking down that mindset, I think, is one of the biggest barriers. And then it's whether they can really stick to that mindset and and fight off that and be resilient against other people's mindsets that they're throwing at them. So whether that's conventional vet that's telling them, you know, the dog gets a bit of diarrhea and, of course, it's the raw diet fault or something. And look, I'm not trying to throw my um, my peers under the bus or anything like that. They're, it's just a genuine mindset, isn't it, with the people? So whether it's them being resilient enough to understand that, you know, what the benefits of raw diet and, and, and these mindsets of these other people saying, no, it's not balanced. You're going to be causing issues. The dogs are going to have deformities. They're going to have this problem, that problem. That's definitely one big issue. I think there's a bit of a, a lack of transparency in the um, pet food industry that also means that people don't feel strong enough in their understanding of what is in the food. They don't know how to read food labels so again there's an education component that that I think affects a lot of people and and then we're talking about the fear of bacterial contamination would be one of the biggest issues um and and again it, I I often find that if a dog gets an upset tummy and it's on a raw and fresh diet it's always the diet whereas if it's a dog that's eating processed food well it picked something up at the park didn't it it wasn't it couldn't possibly have been the diet so it, there's a bit of scaremongering around it and if you look at I remember reading a, a report by Connor Brady or, or I'm, I'm sure it was him who there was like he reported that there was 700,000 tons of kibble that was recalled for salmonella but only I don't know what was it 900 of, of um, raw food? Sure, all sounds like quite a lot, but on a relative scale, there is so much more in the kibble world that's recalled with pathogens. And we have to remember, you can get E. coli and Salmonella from everything, you know, from from fresh food, from raw food. So it's about using a bit of common sense, isn't it, about the way you handle food? You're not going to get some raw food, raw meat, leave it in the sun in a 40 degree day in Australia for three hours and then wonder why your dog got an upset tummy it's just people just need to use a bit of common sense with with things and handle things properly and there's such little risk so again me still comes back to education but it's it's a mindset challenge it's a, an education about the risk and um the you know and then the resilience against that scaremonger really and and it's just yeah for me, it's all education. Thank you, Dr. Nicole. That, that is wonderful because, again, you say, it sounds like I was talking and I think that's, well, no, that's a bad way of putting it. I just enjoy what you just said because I agree with you entirely. And um, this whole idea that every meal has to be complete and balanced, well, what animal out in the wild has a computer and a spreadsheet to make sure that that's what they do over evolutionary time? It's never happened. And what we rely upon are the homeostatic mechanisms that have been designed to work with real food. And those homeostatic mechanisms are able to pull out, even from something that would appear to be deficient in terms of AVCO, everything they need if it's presented as real food. So that's, that's so important to understand. I, I think um, this, as you said, it's a mindset. It's a mind challenge. Now, um, Dr. May, would you like to add anything to that little discussion? Yes. Um, well, the challenges are mostly the same. Uh, adding the transition part and where they get scared about the protein levels and the kidney disease, that is something that is huge for cats. And we we already know that it's not about the protein levels, it's the, it's the quality of the protein. So it, it actually talks in, in our favor for that. But also in the bacterial contamination, I think there is, there's is there been a, a huge misconception about that we live in a bacterial world. You know, we, we are surrounded with bacteria and we, we there is something that we don't understand that uh, that the, I don't know if, if it's the way that we live our lifestyles or what what how this thought came through. But the thing is that we live in ecosystems and ecosystems actually thrive when there is more variety, when, you know, there is competition, there is uh, synergies, there are, you know, different ways of relationship in the biology world, right? So the problem is that Subtly, we believe that, you know, this bacteria has to be isolated or this or we have to clean everything and wipe everything out. And then, uh, you know, and if we create these disbalances, uh, that is when the risk actually 
show it appears because you're not allowing this ecosystem to actually work and create that competition and allow the the pathogens to be at you know and not not easily getting into your foods and and this is something that i uh, i always tell people that when when they say no but kibble you know it, it's sterilized and and all these things and i say Yes, but once you put it on a bowl, there is bacteria around the house that is going to get there and colonize everything because they have the space because that was wiped out. And then you have everything there fighting for, you know, who wins. So I, li I like to talk like that with when I give this education. I try to people make, it, make them people understand how this actually works. And I said, imagine if you put something that already has its role, realm. And, uh, you know, somebody new comes in and they, they are not, they're not going to allow it to get in so easily and colonize. So it becomes a little bit even safer to have more bacteria around if you have variety and diversity than if you just wipe everything out and just leave it out in the open. And this is something that we don't understand. And it, this is for ourselves as well. Our microbiome, uh, the, the, the lifestyles that we get not cleaning everything up and try to get, keep everything sterile. That's impossible. It's best to understand and keep our immune systems working and, and you know, and adding supplements if needed. That's, that's the thing if you, if, you, if you need help in some ways, right? So that's the thing because, tox for example, in cats, it's kidney disease and toxoplasma. Those are the biggest uh, topics, right? So when somebody's pregnant and they're, they were feeding raw, they said, oh, my, uh, my doctor says that or whether I have to get rid of the cat, which I tried to tell them to change doctors. But <laughs> uh, besides that, uh, when they say, no, you're feeding raw, then you cannot get next to anything raw. And uh, and I, I explained that, you know, uh, raw food is anti-inflammatory and reduces the risk of toxoplasma if you, if you feed a, a good source of food, right? Of course, you have to keep something clean and, and uh, safe, say, uh, safety foods, right? Not, not just simply any, any sort of meat. But then uh, if you have minimum care and a little bit of common sense, there's no problem at all. And this is what I like to transmit because uh, there is a huge thing about uh, this misconception about bacteria and, the, and, and everything. So yeah, education is the key. Here. Thank you, Dr. May. I think it's important for people to understand that whether you're a cat, dog, or a human, your immune system is there to live in harmony with the bacteria that we're living with. It's not there to, to fight them. The only time it has to fight them if it's one of them becomes too rampant, too many, too, it becomes too huge in number. And as you've pointed out, if you produce a sterile food, that can be colonized very quickly if there happens to be in the environment some pathogenic bacteria. So you're sit producing a situation that could actually be worse. But more importantly too, or just as importantly, is the fact that if the food contains small amounts of salmonella, E. coli, compilobacter, that's actually necessary to say to the immune system, look, I'm here, and the immune system says, I know you're there, and I know how to put you down if you become naughty. But if it's not there, the immune system forgets about it. Or if it's never been there, the immune system doesn't learn how to deal with it if it should become suddenly increasing in numbers. And so it's important that there's always that little bit of pathogens, even in the food, and that way the immune system learns to deal with it and knows how to deal with it and recognizes it because the immune system is all about recognition, living in harmony with the environment because we've lived with that environment for millions and millions of years. In fact, we actually come from a bacteria and an archaea a long time ago, about 3 billion years ago, actually. But putting all that aside, learn to think of bacteria in food as your friend. It's part of the microbiome. And it's important that immune system recognizes those things. All right. What I want to move on to now is achieving balance. And Dr. Nicole, you've really alluded to this a number of times. So now I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about achieving genuine biological evolutionary balance with a raw whole food and natural way of feeding. 
Ian. I, I think I'm going to have another little chat here where I probably sound like you're talking again. <laughs> so, um, so as we've alluded to, you the obsession with balancing every single meal is not necessary, but of course it is important to provide a balanced diet over a period of time. And most raw feeding vets and people who talk about raw feeding would say, got to aim for balance over the course of a week. I think that's a you know a reasonable period of time. So we don't need raw balance every day. I'll let Amaya talk about uh, the cat. But if we're talking about dogs, that really looks like from an evolutionary point of view is you're looking at 60% raw meaty bone. This is over the course of a week. And when we talk about a raw meaty bone, we're talking about one that's about 50% meat to 50% bone. So lots of people think of bones as those big dinosaur sort of bones. They're not the ones that are giving us all the nutrients that we need. We're talking about raw meaty bone. Um, and these days it's actually so easy to Google meat to bone ratio of different bones. So there's no point in me talking about all the different kangaroo bones here. There's not all Australia. You're not going to get access to it. But in Australia, lots of parents feed a lot of kangaroo bones because they're easy to access. Um, not as many dogs will have adverse reactions compared to chicken and beef, which is a bit more popular these days. But if you're talking about common examples of, a, of one of these 50-50 bones, you're looking at something like a, a chicken wing or a duck neck or something like that. 50% raw meaty bone. And then we're talking about a organ meat, which is our like vitamin powerhouse. And organic beef liver, gram for gram, is probably the most nutritious food on the earth. So we want about 10% organ meat over the course of a week. And half of that should be liver because it is the powerhouse. And the other half should be other sorts of organs, you know, brain, kidney, take your pick. Uh, and then we're looking at our beautiful, what are we up to here? We're 60% there, we're 70. Then we've got to have our beautiful um fruit and vegetables, about 20% of them. And we're looking at colours of the rainbow, just as you would for a human. So don't just feed carrots and broccoli, you know, or don't get the three veg mix from the supermarket. That's not going to achieve balance. We want to ideally source the best quality fruit and veggies we, we can. So if we're going to the supermarket and you're picking these giant, perfectly formed carrots, they're unlikely to be as rich in nutrients as this braggly organic one that hasn't been pumped full of chemicals. So we just sort of remember about the sourcing of the fruit and veggies. And the same with the meat, if you're getting intensively farmed, grain-fed meat, it's going to be you know, have a very different nutrient profile to some organic meat. But I know not everyone can afford organic meat and fruit and veggies. That's fine. But just understand that that may impact the nutrients. So we're doing Colors with Rainbow there. And I'll just mention here mushrooms. Human source mushrooms are fantastic and they're not avocados, not toxic for pets. There's so many things that people think are toxic that aren't. And then the other 10% we're looking at um, what we consider supplements, but this isn't meaning synthetic supplements you buy from the store. This is just things to tick some of the other boxes. So you will commonly have some sort of seaweed or kelp because that's got so many trace minerals. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's like, you know, and trace minerals, amino acids, trace minerals, everything. I usually got an omega balancer. So I know Ian's favorite one is cod liver oil. I know in his his book, which Amaya and I have already spoken about, it, there's a fantastic recipe in there, Balancing Your Omegas, uh, because our world is quite high in our pro-inflammatory omega-6, so that's really important. Uh, and then we love our prebiotic, probiotic sort of food. So as easy as a bit of Greek yogurt, if your dog doesn't have any underlying cat, underlying issues, uh, you can make your own kefir. That's quite popular these days. Uh, you can even, the other thing that's become really popular, which is an amazing source, is green truck. We love it. So that's for your prebiotic, probiotic digestive enzymes. But we're again, we're talking over the course of a week here. You could feed a meal being just a bone. Like you could actually have dinner for a whole day. It could just be raw meaty bone. That's it. That's it. Then the next day, we might then bring in some of the other things. You might have your veggies. You might not have a bone. So it, it doesn't, it's over the course of a week, but you're looking at roughly that sort of ratio. And cats is very different because they're, they're not our not our scavengers like the, the dogs are. So I'll let Amaya talk about that one. Thank you, Nicole. That was beautiful. And words that came to my mind as you spoke was a beautiful is ugly in the terms of uh, vegetables and so on, because it's the mm -hmm. ugly ones that have been grown under probably more difficult conditions, but have actually absorbed the nutrients. Anyway, just keep that in mind that those beautiful ones probably are less nutritious than the ugly ones, the organic ones. 
Maya, can you talk about balancing our cat's diet? Yeah, I would like to say that it would be that simple, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in a way, it's very simple because you simply reduce the amount of veggies that you put in the uh on the dog's diet, and uh, I usually increase the heart content into the mix in the meat, and I like to put a little more heart. Either way, I always supplement with taurine. It's, you know, just to keep my head in, in place and make sure, because you don't never with cats, you never know if they're going to like all the, all the variety of things, right? So you might use liver, you might use our organ meats, you may use whatever you want, but yeah, suddenly they don't want that. And they want something else. My approach is a little bit of self-selection. Actually, I allowed them to choose because I noticed in a course of a year, for example, with my cats, that summertime and winter times are completely different, even in the choices of different meats. So usually I, I, I have like five or, yeah, five or six different meats, but for the whole year. And usually I, I stick with four, you know, uh, and, and, and switch them around for me, variety is the, the best thing you can do with cats. And then about bones or not bones, it will depend on the cat. Because I have, for example, I have a Maine Coon and she likes to have her quails and she likes to eat them. And so for, for her, it's a different uh, ratio kind of thing. And when my other cat doesn't like it. Uh, and in, So, you know, you have to adapt. Uh, cats have also many dental issues be, because they've been eating other things. And, and then uh, when you try to add meaty bones, that's impossible to actually get them to to chew so i think you have to get creative taking in consideration the same ratios just reducing the 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 amount of veggies but then don't go crazy because they are used to having different preys different sources so as long as you keep a, a variety going on and you supplement the minimum things because it, that's the other thing if you put a lot of supplement into a cat's diet they might not have it <laughs> because <laughs> I love mushrooms and I love to use uh, all of those things but I try to keep it very very simple and also I use seasonal veggies and even some fermented veggies uh, depending on, uh, on the time of the year because uh, maybe you use uh, pumpkin for example during uh, winter time but then in the summer they actually like cucumber cucumber or uh or another, the other one, it's zucchini or different. So don't be afraid to use different veggies. I have, I have cats having spinach and they choose it themselves. So, you know, this, the, most people say, oh, my, my cat doesn't like it. Uh, you have to try different ways. You have to maybe ground it or mince it very thin or maybe some other days try to play with the food. Uh, what I do for chewing, well, I explained that on the talk, so I'm not going to just spoil it out. But I explained how you can make your cat to chew and, and make it, you know, because there is a behavioral thing also going on. So my thing is to balance it. Keep in mind that you have to have a range of things, organs, hearts. Hearts is a really good source of taurine and, and, and many other things. And it's a meat that they actually like. Uh, raw meaty bones if you can. And make sure that it's appropriate to their size. Don't get something huge because, you know, they get tired. So you, they chew just two times and then, ah, uh, just whatever. <laughs> and they move to the next thing. And then try to mix everything well. You know, I said, make it with love. Because if you make, if you mix everything in, they might not get the supplements in, in the taste and they will eat it. But if you just simply put everything on the bowl, you might not get that lucky. Thank you, Dr. May. I I think that's where the bath patties come in that you're talking about, where you can grind everything up and mix it together. And and I do that with my cat who really will tell me that she's not going to eat this, that or the other. But if I put, make sure I put some liver in with my bath patties for the cat, and it's always got a fair bit of liver, then she says, yes, I will eat this. I will, not to please you, by the way, just to please me, is what she said. <laughs> so I think what you're going to learn from Dr. Maya is how to think like a cat, and that's very important. Thanks. All yep. right. Now, very quickly, Dr. Nicole, can I, you give the uh, people who are out there 
any tips on transitioning to raw and maybe just concentrate on the um, dog and we're going to ask Dr. Mayer to talk about transitioning, give her the really hard one, transitioning cats to raw. I'm, I'm quite pleased I get to talk about the dog because I've the gun. I'm looking forward to Dr. <laughs> Mayer's talk. I think I'm going to learn so much because I find them quite challenging. So I'll pick the easy topic. Uh, transitioning to dogs onto raw. Uh, I think for me, it depends on the dog I'm dealing with. And it depends on the personality of the client. So there's some really great research out there that shows that whether you do a rapid transition or a slow transition, you tend to get the same outcome, the same frequency of digestive upset. There's a real mindset to do a slow transition. I think most of us recommend slow transition. So it depends on the client. If I have a client that's quite laid back, open, I'm not worried they're going to get quite anxious about what's happening. And I have a young healthy animal, I'll just do a 24-hour fast or a 12-hour fast, depending on the animal. I might give it a little bit of bone broth or something like that, but I'll do a, a fast. And then the first meal will either be a raw meaty bone or a single protein. I don't go too much variety and I'll stick with a single protein for a couple of days, just let them get used to it. And then we'll start getting a bit more adventurous. I don't, I might add in some sort of probiotic, but I don't get adventurous with a lot of variety and a lot of supplements at this point. We just do that transition. I find that works for lots of people because it's easy. If I have a client that I worry will get quite anxious about the process, if there's a, a slightly loose stool or they're a bit off their food, or I have a dog that has inflammatory bowel disease, allergies, things like that, really fussy. I go pretty slow on these guys. So what I'll often do is I'll often actually start with supplements and and when I'm talking about that, I'm saying prebiotic, probiotic, digestive enzymes, and I'll work their gut health before I actually do a transition. So whatever they're currently feeding, I'll work on their gut health for sometimes a couple of weeks, and then we'll just do a very slow transition. So we're talking. When we get to the raw food, we're talking maybe 20, 25% of their diet replaced with a raw diet. We do that for a few days. If there's no digestive upset, we then go to 50%. We do that for a few days. And again, we're single protein here. We're not going variety. We'll do that for a few days. And then we'll build up to 75%. To do that for a few days, 100%. Do that for a few days. And once we're there, then I'll bring in another protein. And then I'll bring in another protein. I'm aiming for at least sort of three to four proteins overall to get a nice variety of amino acids and, and a good nutrient profile. And then I might start adding in more veggies and, and things like that. So it's very slow, but it, for me, it depends on the, the underlying health issues and the client needs and wants. Because the worst thing we can have is the client almost shaking their hands as they're putting down the bowl going, please eat this. And the dog's going, what are you doing? You're moisting me. Like they, that emotional contagion is such a real thing. Um, it needs to work for the household. In other words, it can be done. We just need a very sympathetic and understanding vet. And I know they're out there. So seek them out. Dr. Mayer. So thank you for that, Dr. Nicole. Dr. Mayer, tell us about cats. <laughs> Okay, everything you said about Nicole, about uh, the 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 client, it's completely true. I mean, they get paranoid about certain things, and uh, there is a lot of of, the, of that going on. So uh, I also, you know, I asked them, "How would you do it?" Right. So my question is, "How would you do it?" And then I ask, "How is your how your cat behaves? You know, what what does he do?" And after we get that clear, then I decide how I'm going to approach it because uh, if you if, if you put any fear to a, any cat guardian, then you're lost. You, you lose them. So I have to be very careful in how I approach every single case. And then once I have it, I, what I what I say is, uh, if you want to jump into it, there's no problem. I mean, everybody everywhere have a loose tool some sometime for any reason right so there is no problem if you if you have it one time so I, I explain that to them and say you are you're transitioning to a new food but if you're afraid to do it and and then you you transmit that to the you know to the when you're putting the bowl down and you're expecting the cat to eat and you're watching them that's you know the cat is going to look at you like what is what are you doing right so is this unsafe you're giving me poison <laughs> you know and so that uh, there for for me, that's the biggest uh, challenge that a a guardian has with with the bowl. It's actually their their issue, not the cat's issue. 
Then we have the addiction to ultra processed foods because it is an addiction. Uh, the cat is used to, and the cat creates like a safety net around their food. They have heat feeding habits because it's important for them. And then if you don't understand that and you just simply switch it, they might get, you know, that might alter many other things. So you have to look into their environment. As you can see, transition for me, the first thing is to create real expectations for depending on where the cat starts to transition from, and then uh, talk to the guardian and explain everything. And then really, you know, long time later on, you get to the nutritional part of things. And then you decide, usually I, I do like you, a monoprotein, single protein. And then, you know, I don't, I don't put many things into the diet uh, until I feel safe that, you know, the cat is eating it, is not getting tired of it. But the environmental, the mindset of the guardian and the real expectation you know, don't be afraid to take a step back and then move forward again. That it's actually where the success is going to come from. Thank you so much. Could I just make mention too that in my experience, certain things will actually cause diarrhea. Lots of meat with no bones, lots of mm -hmm. organ meat will cause diarrhea. And one of the things that tightens both dogs and cats up if they will eat it, and of course dogs easy, cats not quite so easy, is bones, raw meaty bones. So that the bone itself and all the components in the bone have a way of stopping the diarrhea. It's one of the simplest ways to do it. All right, so where are we at? Well, we are coming to the end of this panel discussion. So I'm going to ask for each panelist now, and I'm going to reverse the order, for each panelist to give us a short and sweet tip, something maybe they haven't even discussed or something they re need to re-emphasize right now on raw and natural feeding. So I'm going to start off with Dr. Mayer. What are your very short, very sweet and, and powerful tips for our people out there listening? Okay. Uh, for cats in transition, review the, the daily routine that you have with your cat and make sure as a predator that it's safe. I mean, they, for them, eating and using the litter box are the most vulnerable times. So get into their shoes and you're you're going to be able to feel the way they feel and that's the the first step my cat tells me don't let me feed out here in the open put it in my very special box where i spend the night or where i like to rest and i will happily eat it if you don't do that you can take that food away and do something else with it make the dog fatter if you wish but I love to eat it in seclusion and safety. Mm -hmm. Dr. DeCole, your final tip. My tip for all the par parents out there is to not fear feeding real food to your pet. It's not as hard as it's made out to be. And by following what they do and want naturally, we will give them their best life. And just educate yourselves and find your resources. Listen to the Pet Summit. And you'll walk away a different pet guardian. You'll arm yourself with the knowledge so you can understand how to feed your pet to firstly improve their mental health. My goodness, the research is out there. Your gut really is everything. And feeding a highly processed diet will no doubt lead to anxiety and mental health issues and things like that. So let's look after their mental health, their physiological health, less cancer, less inflammation, all of that, less vet feeds as Ian said, but just aren't you stuck with the education so you're confident, but don't fear feeding your pets real food. It's amazing. Fantastic. Put away that fear. That is so important. Well, everybody out there, I trust we have whetted your appetite for this raw and natural feeding summit, which is starting tomorrow. I really hope that you now are enthusiastic because this is where the truth lies for the health of your dog and your cat. There is nothing more powerful than the proper food to get that health and longevity that you want for your pets. So please come armed with an open mind. Be ready to do whatever works for you to get the most from each presentation and interview. And I look forward to your questions in the Q&A sessions, which I urge you to attend because they too are a great learning experience. So I'm Ian Billinghurst, and I will see you at the summit together with our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.